Hello, uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, and uh, welcome, uh, welcome you again to this World Lot River and the Delta System Source to Sync webinar series. And this is Paul Liu from uh, NC State University. And today uh, we are very happy to invite uh, Dr. Edward Tipper from the University of Cambridge, British, to give a talk about the silicate weathering from the world's largest rivers. And before I talk, introduce Edward, I want to introduce you to the next webinar this Friday, this coming Friday, October 2nd. Um, we will have Professor Edward Anthony to give a talk about the river delta and the longshore sediment fluxes, and particularly the case study of the Amazon River, Mekong River, Irrawaddy River, and the Niger Deltas. So uh, please mark your calendar, same time this Friday, this coming Friday, October 2nd, uh, 9 a.m. U.S. Easter, Coast Easter time, 2 p.m., 3 p.m. in Paris, and Beijing, 9 p.m. So, uh, okay, um, Edward is a lecturer and a fellow of the Johns College in University of Cambridge, uh, UK. And uh, as uh, uh, here, as you can see, he got his degree, master and PhD from the University of Cambridge. And then as postdoc at the France, RPGP. And so uh, then have a uh, other postdoc at uh, ETH at Hard Derek, and then back to the uh, 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 Cambridge. So uh, Edward is an expert working on so many large river systems. I know him by his work working on the Himalaya uh, mountains river, particularly in the upper reach to the middle reach, um, understand the carbon fluxes. So now I give the, um, the floor to Edward. Edward, please. There we go. So perfect. Thank you, Paul, uh, for the uh, introduction. And uh, thank you for uh, coming and listening uh, remotely to this and uh, thanks for organizing this fantastic uh, seminar series. It's, uh, it's terrific to be part of it and it's terrific to be able to bring people together uh, from so many different time zones uh, uh, all at the same time in a way that would never ordinarily be possible. So it's, it's nice to see a silver lining uh, uh, come out of the, the situation that's going on at the moment. And today I'd like to probably talk about something slightly different or uh, maybe change track perhaps from some of the previous seminars in this series and, and talk about uh, chemical fluxes from uh, source to sink and in particular silicate weathering and carbonate weathering. And before I begin, I really need to say that, that most of the work or much of the work that I'm talking about today is, uh, is really the work of a whole team of people that, uh, that we have not only here in Cambridge, but that we've been uh, uh, collaborating with from other universities across the world, but also other countries uh, across the world. And in particular, the work I want to talk about uh, today, it, it wouldn't have been possible or has developed or has been driven by uh, really three people in particular. And those people are uh, Emily Stevenson uh, down here, who's been uh, driving a very significant portion of the work, uh, Yartis Bar uh, Baronis, uh, over here or, or over here who's been a postdoc, in fact both of them have been postdocs with me over the last three years and who've really driven a massive uh, amount of this uh, work forward. And then the other person whose work I want to really highlight today is Katie Relf who is here uh, in the middle who finished up her PhD with me uh, uh, last year. And so what I want to do is sort of talk through a bit of a textbook view of silicate and carbonate weathering. Um, uh, before I then want to sort of uh, think about perhaps a new view or perhaps how we should start to, to think about these things. So, I mean, really silicate weathering cycle is, uh, is an archetypal sort of global cycle of from source to sink where we have rocks exposed on the continents uh, somewhere over here. They get chemically dissolved by uh, carbonic acid amongst other things. And there is a transfer of matter uh, to the oceans. And usually people thinking about chemical weathering are thinking about uh, a transfer of solute matter uh, to, the, to the oceans. And uh, 
we sort of worry about this or are interested in this from a global climate point of view because it, it effectively the, the simplest possible reaction of chemical dissolution that you can write down if you take a, a feldspar on the continents, a calcium bearing feldspar in this case, and you take carbonic acid. And the key thing about carbonic acid, of course, is that it is taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It's essentially an equilibrium between carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and, and water. So you take carbonic acid, you dissolve the calcium bearing silicate and you transfer carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And on a short time scale, on a catchment time scale, you transfer it to the bicarbonate reservoir in a river water or in the oceans. And on a longer time scale, you take some of that carbon dioxide and transfer it, sequester it into uh, calcium carbonates in the oceans as, as marine limestones. And this very simplistic idealized reaction has been thought for a long time to be one of the key reactions that acts as a climate feedback, as a negative climate feedback. Taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, weathering rates accelerate uh, at higher temperature because of the increased uh, kinetics of the, the reaction. Uh, and that draws carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And when it is cooler, uh, that reaction slows down, which would correspond to when you have less carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. Carbonate weathering, on the other hand, and of course it's, it's essential to remember that we have large amounts of carbonates exposed on the continents. Carbonate weathering, well, that also occurs with carbonic acid, H2CO3, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, calcium carbonate. And that releases calcium two plus ions uh, to the oceans and it also, uh, and to rivers and to the critical zone in general. And it um, uh, also delivers bicarbonate uh, to the oceans and to the critical zone as well. Uh, but it's usually thought of as a carbon neutral process. And the reason it's thought of as a carbon neutral process is that when you have the reverse reaction or you have precipitation of calcium carbonate in the oceans, uh, you release the CO2 back to the atmosphere. The CO2 that was initially consumed by stabilizing carbonic acid gets re-released back to the atmosphere and it's generally thought of as a, as a carbon neutral uh, reaction. And that really is the textbook view of silicate weathering and carbonate weathering as you'll find it in any textbook. And what I wanna think about today really is uh, present a series of data to you from some of the world's largest rivers where we start to raise a question silicate weathering might be significantly smaller than has previously been thought. And then secondly, in the second half of the talk, I wanna think about carbonate weathering and actually think that rather than being CO2 neutral, depending on how you look at it, it might actually be a source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And so these two things combined may well mean that we need to think a little bit more about how the so-called silicate weathering feedback operates and how it affects climate. And I suppose we're thinking about it in a slightly different way to the way much of the literature has evolved over the past few decades. And most people or most groups thinking about chemical weathering fluxes are thinking about the dissolved load being delivered by rivers into the oceans. And what we're thinking about, at least for the first half of this talk or so, is thinking about a combined dissolved load and sediment load. And there are far fewer groups thinking about the chemistry of sediments uh, being delivered to the oceans. Uh, there are certainly some people thinking out there, the French groups of uh, Paris and Nancy, uh, led by Gaillardet and Christian Franslanon, really have been the pioneers in thinking about how uh, sediment chemistry works and how it might link into chemical weathering. And I want to sort of try and present a slightly new aspect on, on that today. And, Sediments have, have got some advantages over other ways of thinking about chemical weathering, because if you work on a large river, the chemistry of those sediments, they integrate almost continental uh, sized basins. Uh, and that can be a, a very important way of getting an integrated and indeed a time integrated, a spatially integrated and a temporally integrated uh, signature of, of chemical weathering uh, from the continents. So, I mean, let's just think about what sediments are made of. This is a, a picture of one of our filter papers 
uh, I believe from the Salween River on the on the right here and you know sediment it's it's dirt uh, it looks dirty um, uh, but it's obviously made up of multiple components you can see there's all sorts of different things in here there's organic carbon uh, present in here and there are a number of different particulate uh, phases of course which are which are present different mineral phases uh, and if we try and look at the chemical composition of, of what is present in here, we can try and break down the composition of the sediment by using a set of chemical extractions. And, you know, if we, if we look at the total amount of mass in the sediment, almost all of it is present in silicate phases. Uh, a very small part of that, total part of that sediment is present in something called the exchange pool, which I'm gonna talk a lot more about. It's the main focus of this, uh, of the first half of this talk. Uh, Iron oxides, which we can extract chemically, uh, make up a certain amount of the exchange pool, and carbonates, which we can extract in different chemical ways here using acetic acid uh, and, and dolomite, we can, we can uh, extract as well. And they sort of account for a given amount of the, of the suspended sediment or the particulate load that is, that is leaving the continents and entering uh, the oceans on its journey from source to sink. So, I mean, when you look at the picture like this, you can see why sediment is sort of left behind. All of these pools in here that I'm talking about in on the diagram, the exchange pool, the oxides and the carbonates, they're all quite reactive. And the silicates, relatively speaking, are, are, are relatively unreactive. And, you know, the take home message here, it, it would look like that these are all a really small parts. They're not very important. They don't account for a large proportion of the total mass that we've got present. But if we start pulling that apart and looking at individual elements, calcium in this particular case, calcium is obviously interesting because it's calcium that combines with CO2 or with a carbonate ion to form calcium carbonate and remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So if we look at calcium, for example, well, silicates are still the most important reservoir in our sediments or in many of our sediments, but the exchange pool starts to account for quite a lot. Uh, this thing here called iron oxides, this is also dissolving some carbonates, which is why they're so high in here. But you can see that we start to have significant amounts of carbonate uh, start uh, beginning to account for a, a significant mass of calcium in this case in our sediment. So if you know, if we imagine our sediment as a package here, um, you know, calcium, one of the key elements we're interested in, well, a lot of it, a significant part of it, starts to be present in these other pools within the sediment, which are much more reactive than silicates and will react on a, on a timescale of the transport from uh, source to sink. And what I want to home in on today is this thing called the exchange pool and try and figure out what the exchange pool is and what it means for rivers and what it means for the silicate weathering feedback. And so the exchange pool is something which people in the soil community have known about for decades and have worked on for decades. And uh, people who work on aquifer chemistry have also done extensive work on, uh, but people working on rivers have, have largely neglected it. And what the exchange pool is, is a pool of ions, mobile ions, such as calcium, uh, magnesium, sodium, and uh, potassium, which are loosely bound to particulate surfaces, in particular clay minerals. And it's in particular clay minerals because intrinsically, because of the clay mineral structure and composition, clay minerals tend to have a negative surface charge or a negative interlayer charge, which these positive ions or cations which are present within waters uh, can bind to and will tend to bind to. And so these cations, and of course these are the critical cations for chemical weathering, calcium, magnesium, sodium and potassium are the ions which matter for understanding chemical weathering. These are weakly bound to this thing called the exchange pool. And the composition of the exchange pool varies depending on the composition of the water that it is in equilibrium with. So if on the left here, if you take uh, an old marine clay, for example, well, seawater is of course a sodium chloride uh, water. Seawater is, is, is dominated by, by sea salt, of course, and the exchange pool, which I've represented here by this uh, uh, interlayer uh, reservoir, 
is dominated by sodium. It's not completely sodium when it's in equilibrium, when a clay mineral is in equilibrium with seawater, but it's dominated uh, by uh, sodium. Whereas if you take a river water and put that, uh, put a clay in a river water and allow it to equilibrate with uh, uh, the river water, you will find that the exchange pool or the interlayer composition is dominated by uh, calcium in the main. River waters, of course, being mainly calcium bicarbonate waters. Uh, and so depending on the composition of your river water or your natural water that you happen uh, to put your suspended sediment or your clay minerals into, the exchange pool will change uh, composition. So despite the fact that clays or the exchange pool bound to clays are, are important for understanding waters, uh, river waters, there's almost no, almost no work on it. The seminal study on cation exchange in river waters on the Amazon River, uh, a wonderful study actually by Sales and Mangelsdorf is from 1979, uh, no less, uh, where they actually reacted Amazon River sediment with, uh, with seawater to try and understand the exchange pool. They actually made measurements of the exchange pool in a really well thought out piece of work actually, very, very good. Uh, and uh, the exchange pool was sort of revived in 1989 by this very interesting paper by, by Serling et al, where they considered the exchange pool and uh, hypothesized uh, based on the chemistry of waters that the silicate weathering flux had been overestimated. And that's really the idea of that paper that I want to explore in more detail today. And then really the only other data on the riverine exchange pool is much more recent and it's by Martin Lupker et al from 2016 uh, uh, with a very nice paper on the Ganges and Brahmaputra uh, river systems where they actually measured the exchange pool. There are other studies out there which uh, suggest uh, or even demonstrate the importance of the exchange pool for river waters but there are very few measurements of the exchange pool on suspended sediment and it, it turns out to be a very important thing. It's known to be important for when sediment discharges into, uh, into the oceans, for example. Uh, so this is a, a rather spectacular picture of the, uh, of the Mackenzie River Delta. So this is the Mackenzie River. This is the Mackenzie River here, which is disgorging sediments uh, into, uh, into the Beaufort Sea here. And all of this sediment, of course, has an exchange pool. And that exchange pool, uh, which is dominated by continental uh, weathering reactions, that exchange pool is uh, reacting and changing as it, as it reacts with seawater, it changes matrix. Uh, and calcium gets released into seawater and sodium gets bound onto uh, the exchange pool as that sediment reacts. And that's very well known. And so that's the sink process. That's what happens at the sink but of course that exchange pool is also being supplied by the source. This is a picture of a series of shales from the Peel River Basin uh, in the Mackenzie uh, River, one of the major tributaries of the Mackenzie River. And the Peel River uh, happens to be dominated by a whole series of uh, marine shales. And you can see these wonderful uh, bedded black shales here. So these are providing the source, the dominant source of the exchange pool uh, in the uh, Peel and the Mackenzie River system. Uh, and the sink is, of course, when it gets to the ocean. And it's the same in any river basin. This is the headwaters of the Cozy River Basin, high in the Himalaya or just north of the Himalaya in southern Tibet, where there are a whole series of uplifted uh, black shales which contribute uh, to the suspended sediment and to the exchange pool. And so with the team of people that I've been working with over the past few years, we've been incredibly fortunate to travel to many different parts of the world and to collect a whole suite of our own samples from uh, the Yukon and the Mackenzie River uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Canada, for, to the Red River in Vietnam, the Mekong River as it transitions across many different countries, the Salween River uh, in uh, Myanmar, the Irrawaddy River in Myanmar, and a series of major tributaries to the Ganges River in Nepal. And we're going to compare that to some literature data uh, from Martin Lutka on the Ganges and Brahmaputra, which I already mentioned, and the seminal 
uh, literature study on the Amazon by Sales and Mangelsdorf to try and put together a, a global picture of what's going on uh, with the exchange pool and how it affects uh, silicate weathering. And so why, why do we care? What's, why should this matter? Is this a big effect? Is this a small effect? Or you know, should, should we not care? And so what I've plotted here is the flux of calcium. On the right hand side, we've got the flux of calcium in the exchange pool. Uh, so bound to the suspended sediment, weakly bound to the suspended sediment, uh, normalized to the amount of calcium in the dissolved pool. And uh, we're looking at that as a function of the total suspended sediment in the river. And uh, we're on a logarithmic scale here, which makes it a little bit difficult to read, but that means that if we are above this red line here, which hopefully you can see more than 5% of total calcium is in the exchange pool. 5% of total calcium is in the exchange pool. If we're above this line here, 10% of total calcium is in the exchange pool, not in the dissolved load. If we're above this line here, 50% of total calcium is in the exchange pool. And obviously if we're above the one uh, line up here, which we have got a handful of samples, which are above one, it means that we have more calcium being transported in the exchange pool than we do in the dissolved pool, which is quite a remarkable finding uh, to start with. And you can see that we're looking at this for a variety of different river systems from around the world. This is making use of the entire uh, data set that we have available uh, from large rivers, in addition to one or two small rivers, which we have, for, exa for example, from Svalbard or the Dama Glacier in the Central Alps, which are very, very small rivers right in the source headwaters um, of other river systems. So the exchange pool matters is the bottom line. I mean, that, that's the simplest result. The actual flux of material matters. And where it matters more, you can see it's obviously a strong function of the amount of particulate uh, matter in the river. So where it matters more is where the sediment fluxes are higher. And of course, many of you will be familiar with this sediment uh, map or compilation of uh, sediment flux data from uh, Milliman and Farnsworth. And one key area where it matters is Southeast Asia. You can see the size of the sediment arrow leaving Southeast Asia. And that's of course because it's tectonically active. Uh, in particular, uh, the area which interests us is the area uh, of the Himalaya and Tibetan Plateau, the tectonic uh, activity associated with that. And of course, it just so turns out that these same areas are thought to be uh, carbon dioxide consumption hotspots through uh, silicate weathering. So that this is a, a, a diagram from uh, Jens Hartmann's uh, paper showing the carbon consumption fluxes. You can see these red colors in here are, uh, are CO2 hotspots or carbon consumption uh, hotspots. So these are areas of the world that really matter. And so what I want to do is try and delve in and try and understand uh, the exchange pool a little bit more to think about uh, if we can see how much it matters uh, other than just quantifying the relative amount of calcium in the exchange pool to the dissolved pool and to try and explore the consequences of it. And to begin to do that, I just want to look at the, the composition of the exchange pool. And so on the left hand diagram here, we're looking at the exchange pool from our uh, global compilation of rivers. Ignore all of the small red dots on this diagram for now. I'll come back to those later in a different slide. But essentially all of our data, or the vast majority of our data plots in this region here, uh, I should say that we're looking at uh, calcium on this apex of the triangle, uh, magnesium on this apex of the triangle, and the sum of sodium and potassium on this apex of the triangle. They're referred to as beta calcium, beta sodium, and uh, beta magnesium and beta sodium and potassium because it, it just refers to the fractional amount of calcium in the exchange pool or magnesium in the exchange pool. So it's the fraction of magnesium to calcium, magnesium and sodium and potassium. That's all beta means. And so, I mean, the take home message is really pretty clearly that the riverine exchange pool is dominated by calcium and magnesium. Right? It's very much up at the end of the, the calcium end of this triangle and scatters down a little bit towards magnesium. Uh, and that's the exchange pool itself. That's the measured exchange pool uh, in, in these large rivers that we're looking at. 
whereas the water uh, doesn't scatter like that at all. This is the water composition on the right hand side here. And if we look at the composition of the water, we can see the water composition scatters far more towards the sodium and potassium uh, apex on this diagram. And so there's a difference in the composition of the water and the exchange pool. Now that difference is actually expected because there are a series of selectivity coefficients when a water equilibrates with a clay. The exchange pool doesn't just simply reflect the composition of the water that it is in contact with, it, uh, it, it equilibrates with that water, but becomes chemically fractionated or chemically partitioned from that water. And that's something that's really quite well understood and, and quite well known, and indeed is, uh, is straightforward to model whether our uh, measured exchange pool is in equilibrium with the water. And the vast majority of our samples are within chemical equilibrium with the water. If any of the symbols are in gray, such as this symbol in here, it means that we've calculated that that particular sample is not in chemical equilibrium uh, with the water for whatever reason. But we have some pretty good evidence that our waters and our exchange pool really have reached equilibrium. And this is a, a lovely piece of uh, data that was uh, generated by uh, um, uh, Emily Stevenson, myself, and a master's student, uh, uh, Vicky Alcock. And uh, where we demonstrate, where we generated some strontium isotope data on a large number of these samples and where we measured strontium isotope data on both the river water on the x-axis and uh, the exchangeable pool on the y-axis. Uh, and I plotted the one-to-one -one line uh, on this diagram. And you can see that the waters uh, and the exchange pool really scatter about the one-to-one -one line. Now, Strontium isotopes, you don't need to know much about strontium isotopes at all. All strontium isotopes are telling us are really about the source of the material which is present. And what they're telling us in this case is that the source of the water and the source of the exchange pool must be identical. That's what the strontium isotopes are telling us. And what that means is, of course, that we've reached equilibrium. Now, on the, uh, if you know anything about strontium isotopes or if you're familiar with strontium isotopes, you'll realize that we're spanning a very, very large range in strontium isotopes on this diagram. And that's because we've got a lot of samples from uh, the Himalaya. These uh, green hexagons in here are from the Himalaya. And uh, what I wanna do is just zoom in on this region here to examine this a little bit more. So the next slide, hopefully, ah, it's gone. The next slide is gone. But never mind, if I had it and we could zoom in in here, we would see that uh, that scatter about the one to one line is actually still very, very good in this region here. You just can't see it on this particular scale of uh, diagram that, that we've got. But if we zoom in here, that one to one correlation is still uh, really very, very good indeed. And so we know that the river water is in equilibrium with the exchange pool, what are the consequences going to be for silicate weathering? What does this mean for silicate weathering? Well, what it could mean, and this really is the hypothesis which Serling et al explored back in 1989, is if we, in the source regions of these rivers, if we have a significant amount of uplifted uh, marine rocks, or marine rocks, or marine clays in particular, fine grain rocks will have equilibrated with seawater. They are gonna have an exchange pool, which is high in sodium. That sodium or that exchange pool will re-equilibrate with natural waters, will deliver sodium to the natural waters and will get replaced with calcium. And the reason that matters is because sodium, the sodium ion is one of the things that we base our estimates of silicate weathering on. And so if we have an additional source of sodium to the critical zone, to rivers, then it means that we may well be over attributing the total amount of sodium in a river to silicate weathering, and it may be derived from somewhere else. So really what we'd like to do to understand carbon consumption, you would ideally, you would know the amount of calcium which is derived from silicate rocks. And so, you know, when I write down my simple schematic reaction, which I wrote down at the beginning, uh, of the talk, I, I took a, a feldspar uh, 
uh, and I just allow that feldspar to weather and deliver calcium to uh, my river. And for every mole of calcium, I will consume uh, one mole of carbon on long time scales. The trouble is tracking calcium in the critical zone is quite a hard thing to do because a huge amount of calcium, the majority of calcium is derived from carbonate weathering. And so we base our estimates of the amount of calcium from silicate weathering, or many people base their estimates of the amount of calcium from silicate weathering based on the amount of dissolved sodium. And this is where cation exchange then starts to matter because if we're supplying extra sodium via an old marine exchange pool to this term here, it means that we've been overestimating the amount of silicate weathering. And so if you think about where sodium should come from in a river water, uh, we might refer to this as sodium silicate, which might uh, equal the total amount of sodium in a river minus chloride. And that's because there's also a supply of salt or a supply of sodium via salt dissolution uh, into the river. And that's common, people have, always corrected for chloride for, for chloride uh, in a river water to correct for, for salt. But now what I'm saying is we need to correct for the exchange pool as well. And so adding this term on the end is really the new part here. The question is, is how much does it matter? Uh, and we can quantify that by our measurements of the exchange pool in our suspended sediment. And this thing called the cation exchange capacity or the CEC, which is the sum of calcium in the exchange pool, magnesium in the exchange pool, sodium and potassium in the exchange pool, times the content of suspended particulate matter, times this thing here called the fraction of, or called beta sodium, which is the fraction of uh, old sodium, which is present in the exchange pool. And so if you have an exchange pool, which was purely in equilibrium with seawater, that would beta sodium would have a value of about 0.6. Uh, but it may not be the case that your exhumed rocks on the continents have got a value of 0.6. That may have been reduced for a variety of reasons, which I'll come to in a minute or two. So what would be the effect on the silicate weathering flux or the amount of silicate derived sodium and hence the silicate weathering flux? Uh, if we uh, look at our data set and try and quantify it. Well, this is a, a diagram. It's a, a complicated diagram and I'm not going to talk about how we calculate it, uh, but I am gonna talk through the consequences of it. So on the x-axis, we're looking at the amount of suspended sediment, the concentration of suspended sediment. And on the y-axis, uh, we're looking at beta sodium. So the amount of sodium effectively that's being supplied by, uh, by the old exchange pool. Uh, and I've contoured it. The colors, the color ramp on this and the contour uh, uh, and the contours on this um, uh, indicate the percentage reduction in the silicate weathering flux. So if we're in a red region on this diagram, it means that we have significantly reduced the silicate weathering flux. In fact, if we are over 100 here, this is in percent, it means we've reduced the silicate weathering flux to zero would be the implication. So based on our measurements of the Salween River, which was collected, our samples were collected in the monsoon season. So high discharge, uh, we collected suspended sediments with an average uh, suspended sediment concentration of just over two grams. And what it means is that the silicate weathering flux would go to zero if the fractional amount of old sodium in the exchange pool was around uh, 0.4 approximately. So significantly less than rocks which are in equilibrium with seawater. And so this means that there really is margin to significantly reduce the silicate weathering flux via the cation exchange process. If we look at another example, this is the Yukon River uh, that was collected uh, in Canada. It's not at the mouth. This is uh, Dawson City in, in Canada. If we look at the Yukon River, well, the average suspended sediment flux on the day we collected uh, 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 samples was just over a gram per litre. And again, for a beta sodium value of 0.4, it means we would reduce the amount of silicate weathering to zero in that system. And that's a major, that's a, that, that, you know, you can't reduce silicate weathering any more than that. That's the percentage uh, reduction uh, in silicate weathering. So why might it be the case that 
beta sodium is not in equilibrium with seawater values? How is it possible that we could reduce silicate weathering to zero uh, without having a beta sodium in equilibrium uh, with, with seawater? And I think probably part of the, there are two possible answers, but a major part of the answer is provided by this lovely study by Mathieu Dillinger in 2014, where he looked at suspended sediments uh, from several different rivers uh, uh, around the world, the Amazon River system, the Ganges Brahmaputra and the, and the Mackenzie River system. And they used lithium isotopes to tease out the fraction of suspended sediments, which uh, were old suspended sediments or, sus or which were old clays, which were being recycled and new clays, which were being formed. And they essentially uh, used a process of unmixing uh, within the river itself. Uh, which allowed the river to unmix itself as a function of depth by exploiting this very clever technique of sampling the river at different depths within the water column. You know, they observed that there was an enormous range in lithium isotopes throughout the water column, about 10 per mil range in lithium isotopes throughout the water column, and used that to, to unmix the, the fraction of old sediment or old marine sediment from new clays which are forming in the modern weathering zone. And they concluded that uh, the majority of clays in these river systems are indeed old uh, clays, but up to 40% might be from the modern weathering system, or could be from the modern weathering system. And of course that will seek to lower uh, the beta sodium value. The other thing that could uh, lower the beta sodium value, the, this initial composition of the exchange pool as it uh, as it gets exhumed, eroded and weathered uh, in the critical zone is, is diagenesis. And there's not a huge amount known about the effect of diagenesis uh, or changes to the exchange pool which might occur during uplift uh, or, or during exhumation, uplift and erosion as these marine sediments transition from a seawater environment to being exposed uh, within mountain belts. But we can get some sort of a feel from it by calculating the exchange pool in equilibrium with groundwaters. So there aren't many measurements of the exchange pools in uplifted or exhumed marine sediments. And those measurements which do exist are slightly conflicting. Some of them are still in equilibrium with seawater. Some of them are significantly lower uh, with beta sodium values of around 0.2 or even less. Remember, a beta sodium in equilibrium with seawater is about 0.6. But if we calculate the beta sodium in equilibrium with uh, groundwaters. And of course, there are thousands, tens of thousands of groundwaters uh, measurements which have been made. These are groundwaters here shown in red, or rather the exchange pool calculated in equilibrium with groundwaters. And you can see the vast majority of the data is down here near uh, uh, towards beta sodium equals one, or certainly in excess of beta sodium equals 0.6. In fact, the mean of the data set is beta sodium equals 0.6, exactly the same as a seawater value. And so I think we've got a, a good piece of evidence that groundwaters or that diagenesis, sorry, doesn't uh, significantly uh, affect the exchange pool, at least not in all cases. And so, you know, what should be clear is two things really. The effect of the exchange pool is a function of the suspended sediment load and it's a function of beta sodium, the amount of old sodium that we have in our system, how much of that old sodium from seawater can be retained uh, within the system. And if we, uh, I've got a, a diagram of how uh, silicate sodium changes here. So this is the amount of silicate sodium or sodium minus chloride uh, in the river water against really the effect of the exchange pool here or the cation exchange pool times uh, the suspended sediment concentration and it's contoured for the percentage reduction in silicate weathering and again if you uh, are if you lie above the 100 uh, contour in this region here on the diagram it means that all silicate weathering uh, there, there is no silicate weathering. All sodium could be explained by a supply of sodium from the exchange pool. Now this is calculated for beta sodium of 0.6, the maximum possible value. Perhaps a more realistic value might be a beta sodium of 0.2 or a, certainly a more conservative value might be 0.2. And you can see that we still 
have some values in this region in here uh, where beta sodium, uh, where the amount of silicate weathering would reduce to zero. So a significant reduction in, uh, in silicate weathering. And these percentages on here, these are, these are contours of the percentage reduction in silicate weathering. So we're looking at a big reduction in silicate sodium. And if we take the average of all of our data set, once we've processed it through, uh, so you can see um, uh, this would be a, a, a beta sodium of uh, 0.6, so the maximum possible effect that, that we've got. Looking at our data set and the literature data sets where it exists, it's a very small effect on the Amazon, which is, of course, one of the world's largest rivers. So it's 10% or less on the Amazon. But the Mackenzie uh, is 71%. And some of the Himalayan tributaries that we're looking at are close to 100%. The Salween, major river in Southeast Asia, 100% reduction in silicate weathering. So this is really very, very important. But we can go further than that because there's a, uh, obviously we'd like to know about rivers where we don't have data and we can model those rivers at the moment based on quite a strong correlation between the aluminium silicon ratio in the suspended sediment and the cation exchange capacity or the CEC. And uh, uh, this is for the Mekong River here. And you can see there's a really extremely strong relationship between those two things. And that's effectively a grain size control. It's well understood that the aluminium silicon is controlled by grain size effects within the water column. And when you have finer grain material, you have more clays, you have a greater surface area, you'll have a higher cation exchange capacity. Now, when we look at the, the entire global data set, the picture is more uh, blurred, but we can uh, do some statistics, we can do some modeling to deal with this uh, and to generate a distribution, a Monte Carlo distribution that allows us to subsample the cation exchange capacity one when we have knowledge of the aluminium silicon ratio. When we do that, we can extend our data set to a much wider array of rivers where the suspended sediment chemistry is known, but where there are no measurements on the cation exchange capacity at the moment. And when we do that, if we work this out for beta sodium at 0.6, the maximum possible, it would imply that there's a global reduction in silicate weathering of up to 28%. Now, if beta sodium was only 0.2, uh, significantly lower, and I think probably a conservative estimate of beta sodium, the silicate weathering reduction would be still 12%, so still uh, really very significant indeed, and particularly significant in the regions where there is high sediment flux, high erosion, and high silicate weathering in the first place. So it's particularly important. Now, I should say that all of these things are a caveat or the caveat on all of these things is good knowledge of the suspended sediment flux. And I'm not going to talk about this today, but I'm just going to give it a little plug. This is work by uh, Yartis Baronis, who's just got a paper out in JGR, uh, doing a, a, a fascinating, really interesting and excellent piece of work on trying to determine not only the suspended concentration, suspended sediment concentration, uh, across the water channel in the Irrawaddy and the Salween rivers in Southeast Asia, uh, but also as a function of time and also mapping out and modeling the organic carbon concentration and various other parameters which are, which are essential to the suspended sediment flux. But really to do this job properly, we would need time integrated suspended sediment fluxes from all of these rivers, which are better than what we've got available at the present time. So hopefully I've convinced you that there's a significant reduction in the amount of silicate weathering, but I'm not done yet. I wanna try, if I can, I see Paul has come back up and maybe he wants to cut me off, but if I could scrape another few minutes, Paul, I would oh, go sure, for of course, something else. Of course, of course. Excellent. Um, I wanna try and convince you of something else that not only is the silicate weathering flux smaller than we previously thought, but also that carbonate weathering may be releasing carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere, offsetting the silicate weather, the CO2 consumption through silicate weathering that we had in the first place. So you remember I told you at the beginning of this talk that carbonate weathering uh, is thought to be CO2 neutral. That's the standard way of writing this reaction. Carbonate weathering is CO2 neutral when you consume carbon dioxide during calcite dissolution, but you re-release it when you precipitate carbon dioxide back in the ocean because it's the exact reverse reaction. 
But over the last few years, there's been increasing interest in carbonate weathering with sulfuric acid and a myriad of papers have come out trying to understand carbonate weathering with sulfuric acid. And uh, sulfuric acid uh, can be supplied by pyrite oxidation. That's the main agent of, uh, uh, of supply of sulfuric acid. And if we allow carbonate weathering to occur in the presence of H2SO4, well, you still supply calcium to the critical zone or to river waters and to seawater, but the carbon dioxide gets degassed straight away back to the atmosphere and gets released to the atmosphere. And so there's been a, a very nice piece of work on this, comparing source to sink uh, regions by Mark Torres uh, in EPSL in 2016, where they set up a very nice framework to consider this over different timescales. And they realized that in headwater streams in the Amazon, there was a short term uh, release of CO2, uh, uh, a longer term release of CO2 uh, at the mountain front and at the floodplain, a consumption of CO2 over long time scales. And what we've been working on here in Cambridge is to try and split this time frame up. I should say that the axes of this diagram are looking at the fraction of acidity effectively on the y axis. Uh, derived from sulfuric acid versus carbonic acid versus the fraction of carbonate and silicate weathering on the x-axis here. So this would be 100% uh, carbonate weathering here and this would be 100% silicate weathering here. And these diagrams change sort of topography if you like depending on the time scale that we're looking at. So on, on short time scales uh, only this upper region of the graph would release CO2 Whereas on long time scales, all of this region uh, in here would release CO2 back to the atmosphere. So if you have data that plots in here, it means you would have CO2 release, uh, for example. Whereas if you have data that plots down here, you've got CO2 consumption. But this all relies on understanding this thing here called f sulf, the fraction of, uh, uh, of uh, sulfate or, uh, or the fraction of acidity which comes from sulfuric acid and that pivotally, pivotally relies on understanding the origin of sulfate in your water and you would probably the natural assumption as an isotope geochemist would be to assume that sulfur isotopes are going to be the way forward to try and distinguish sulfur sources in a river and it's essential that we distinguish sulfur sources because sulfate in a river can be supplied by either pyrite or by gypsum and Gypsum has got no effect on the carbon cycle whatsoever, whereas pyrite weathering, if we have pyrite weathering, it can release CO2. So we need to distinguish gypsum and pyrite weathering. And I want to show you very quickly how we, how we go about doing that. And uh, you would think sulfur isotopes would do a good job at this, but they don't. And the reason they don't is that sedimentary sulfides span a very, very wide range in Delta 34S. And so they're no good for it. So we've been uh, working on uh, on a different method, thinking about how you might uh, trace the origin of dissolved sulfate uh, in a river water, where it's coming from. Is it coming from pyrite or is it coming from another source? And we're doing it by looking at oxygen and where the oxygen is coming from. Now, I can't go through all of the details now because there simply isn't time, but pyrite oxidation can happen via two pathways. There are two main uh, pathways uh, for the oxidative weathering of pyrite or OWP. The first pathway which I've got here is a reaction just involves water. So you take pyrite, add water to it uh, essentially, and uh, you will form sulfate and all of that sulfate, all of the oxygen in that sulfate has only come from water. And that the, the oxidant in that case is Fe3 plus or we can oxidize our pyrite in the, presence of, in the presence of atmospheric oxygen, in which case the oxygen in my sulfate comes from both oxygen in the atmosphere, O2, and oxygen in the water. And it turns out that the former reaction is the most important. And it turns out that at a global scale, there's a significant correlation between the DELO18 of uh, water and the DELO18 of the sulfate molecule that is present within the water. This would be the one-to-one -one line. This would be the line where we would expect the data to scatter if uh, we had pyrite oxidation only with water or a source of oxygen, which only came from water. There's a small isotopic fractionation involved. 
And you can see that the data scatters about an array like this, which is suggestive of this being an important control. And the thing that's driving us away from that equilibrium fractionation line is the presence of gypsum. And I should add that in where this is all happening is, of course, in the headwaters of these catchments, it's happening in the source. This is where pyrite is present in black shales like this, which are present high within uh, the Himalayas in this particular case. And I just want to walk through an example to, to show you some very exciting data where we've been working on three of the world's largest rivers on the Irrawaddy in Myanmar, the Salween in Myanmar, and the Mekong uh, going from uh, southern China uh, through Laos into Cambodia and Vietnam. And we've collected a number of samples uh, from these rivers uh, over the years, most spectacularly on a cruise down the entire length of the Irrawaddy River in 2018, which seems like a, a world away now. But this little animation, which hopefully you can see at the moment, these are actually hourly timestamps from our GPS as we sailed down the Irrawaddy River uh, around 1500 kilometers, cruising down uh, the Irrawaddy, sampling every tributary that was possible along the way before hopping across to sample the Salween River, the, the Salween River over in Southeast uh, uh, Myanmar. And so we've been using oxygen isotopes to separate uh, on all of these tributaries to try and distinguish the source of uh, sulfate in these rivers. And uh, this is just an example of how it works. We're using a very, very simple mixing model, uh, just plotting sulfur isotopes here on the x-axis against oxygen isotopes on, on the sulfate molecule on the y-axis. And this is where gypsum plots. This is a gypsum end member. This is where our river water plots. And this is where pyrite plots along this horizontal uh, line in here on this particular diagram. And so we can unmix these two things very, very nicely and use a simple oxygen isotope mixing model. So this is one example here from a tributary on the Irrawaddy River where the mixing is close to 50-50, i.e. this point is somewhere roughly halfway between the gypsum end member and the pyrite end member down here. And this is an example from the Salween, in this case the headwaters of the Salween, where the river water is almost entirely on the pyrite end member. And the method that we're using here has got the beauty of it that we don't need to know the delta 34S of the pyrite. We can figure it out from the oxygen isotope composition because of the reaction pathway. And so we've done this, Katie Ralph has done this for the Mekong River and Emily Stevenson has done this for uh, the Irrawaddy tributaries. We've done this for every single tributary where we have data. It's a very large amount of work. And it's interesting to sort of map this out spatially across the entire basin. And so here we're looking at the uh, Irrawaddy River here, the Salween River in the middle here, and this is the Mekong Basin throughout here. And where we have color on these diagrams is where we have data, where we have sampled a tributary. And in this particular series of maps, we're looking at the fraction of silicate weathering to carbonate weathering. And where it's blue, it means we have large amounts of carbonate weathering. Well, this is the Salween in here, which is blue, large amounts of uh, large amounts of carbonate weathering. Uh, you can see that the Mekong headwaters have got large amounts of carbonate weathering and the Irrawaddy has got more silicate weathering uh, going on. And if we look at the fraction of sulfate, which is derived from pyrite weathering. This is the fraction of sulfate derived from pyrite weathering, not the total amount of pyrite weathering, the fraction of sulfate derived from pyrite weathering. You can see that the Salween is almost completely uh, uh, associated with pyrite, uh, or sulfate is completely associated with pyrite. The Mekong, we have variable amounts, high amounts of pyrite weathering in here, and we have variable amounts in the Irrawaddy. You put these things together in the Torres framework and think about it on different timescales. What it means is that on short timescales, all of our data is plotting within this region here, which means that on short timescales, we've got CO2 consumption in all of these river basins, the Mekong, the Salween and the Irrawaddy. But if we look at this on long timescales, remember the topology, of this diagram changes when we consider the timescale involved we find that the Salween is a releaser of CO2 on long time scales. The Mekong uh, has got almost no CO2 consumption on long time scales. And the Irrawaddy has still got CO2 consumption, but it's not a huge amount of CO2 consumption. 
and you put that effect together with the cation exchange uh, story and you find that silicate weathering really will be significantly offset. Now in the Mekong we can go one step further because we've got river discharge, we've got flux, so we can actually calculate on a tributary by tributary basis whether we've got CO2 release or CO2 consumption. And this is currently a, a, a manuscript which Katie Ralph has got, got in review at the moment. And so I want to draw it to a close because I know I've gone on a, a long time, but two major things. Cation exchange, the first half of the talk, reduces the silicate weathering flux. That's one thing in itself. But secondly, any silicate weathering flux which is left or carbon consumption associated with the silicate weathering flux which is being left is being offset by CO2 release from carbonate weathering with sulfuric acid. And so there's really sort of a, a double whammy almost on the significance of the silicate weathering feedback that we're beginning to put together from our large rivers data set. And, you know, again, I should just emphasize all of the people who've actually done all of the work on this from master's students to assistants in the field to everyone who's collecting the data in the lab here in Cambridge. And so that's my final slide. So I shall, uh, I shall stop there and hand back over to Paul, I guess. Thank you, Edward. That's a fantastic talk. You know, uh, um, many world, a lot of river system, particularly all the way from the headwaters, that's a silicate weathering. So a uh, lot of information. Thank you, thank you very much. So if you have any question, and particularly for those people who want to leave uh, around time, so please raise your hand, please go ahead to ask a question. So here we have a question from the YouTube channel, the live channel. So uh, uh, Edward, if you click the chat, you also can see the question over there. So the question is from Karen Kumar Reddy. So his question is, silicate weathering is one of the key CO2 to sink and the oxidation of uh, petrogenic organic carbon is a CO2 source. So suppose a region if 95 crystal silicate rocks and also enriched with high organic carbon import, then what could be the best way for us to determine whether this region is a CO2 sink or source? Well, so, I mean, that is quite a specific question. It's a very good question. Uh, if, I mean, if you've got a, a, a region which is predominantly crystalline, you're looking at, uh, at, at mainly silicate rocks in the first place, and you're not dealing with marine sediments. And so most of the cation exchange um, sort of hypothesis or, or, or that, that I sort of talked through in the first half of this talk, on the one hand, it wouldn't necessarily apply, but I'll put one caveat to that. And that is that if you look at basement fluids in many of these regions, it's certainly true in the Himalaya and it's true in the Canadian Shield. They're mostly sodium chloride fluids, which ultimately are attributed to salt. And that salt is ultimately of marine origin. And so even in these crystalline terrains, there can be a, a, a significant, uh, there can be a significant flux of sodium, which is not necessarily of silicate origin. But nevertheless, if you're dealing with crystalline basement, your cation exchange capacity is likely to be quite small because you don't have a large, a, a large amount of clays. Crystalline rocks don't have particularly high cation exchange capacity. So you probably get away with using, with using normal methods in, in, in there. But the, in a, in a broadly, broadly speaking, the question is asking how do you determine CO2? And it's absolutely right to mention one thing that I haven't talked about at all here simply because there isn't time and that's the organic carbon cycle. And of course, that's what's leaving this uh, completely open is what happens to petrogenic organic carbon, both in terms of oxidation of petrogenic organic carbon and then in terms of burial of biospheric organic carbon offshore or within deltaic systems uh, or on shorter time scales within floodplains. Uh, and of course, that I think is the big uh, question that now needs to be addressed. If I'm arguing that the silicate weathering flux has been reduced, then something else must be consuming carbon dioxide. And that is a whole separate set of work that, I, that, that, that needs to be addressed in a, in a separate talk, really. I hope that sort of answers the question. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> 
So when we waiting for other question come in, so Edward, I have a question. You know, you work on many that kind of high mountain, particularly Himalaya uh, mountain de uh, derived the big river systems. So compare the historical data. Uh, did you see any trend with the global warming? You know, the increase of the flux of this, you know, the silicate weathering and export of the CO2. That's, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, and it has been seen in other river systems in terms of the dissolved flux, uh, notably uh, in the US, actually. There's some very nice work on the Mississippi uh, that, that shows an increase uh, in, uh, in, by, in carbon flux over time in the bicarbonate flux. Um, no, to the best of my knowledge, we haven't seen any increase in any, weather, in any weathering fluxes over time. Um, now that might be that the data isn't quite as extensive as you would want it to be. You need quite a long time series. Uh, but even on river systems like the Mekong, where there is a very extensive uh, time series, uh, we, don't, we don't see uh, an increase in weathering mm. over the last 30 or, or even longer years, uh, as, as far as I know. Okay, and uh, very good. We have a question from Deng Kai. Uh, let's unmute. So yeah, okay, please go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for your fascinating talk. That's very impressive. And uh, I have a question on the beta values. So the calculated significant uh, second resident reduction is largely caused by the assumed high beta uh, sodium value of 0 0.6. I mean, from the global maps you showed. And, but according to both the measured like beta sodium data or even beta, uh, beta calcium data presented in your PowerPoint, most of them are actually below 0 0.2. And so I'm actually wondering if, like, if, you, you, if you used a much lower beta sodium value over a global scale, will the reduction of silicate version still be so significant or become actually become insignificant? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. So. Uh, two things. Yes, it, yes, it is sensitive to the beta sodium value. You're absolutely right, and that's that's why we've parameterized it as a function of beta sodium. Uh, but the reason our data has got a low beta sodium is that it has re-equilibrated with the modern critical zone. It has re uh, the cation exchange process is very very rapid. So if you were to take uh, a uh, um, a modern riverine sediment and allow and and put it in seawater just like that picture of the Mackenzie Delta I showed, yeah. the sediment or the exchange pool on that sediment would re-equilibrate very rapidly within minutes, hours, days. And so all of our data set is in equilibrium with the modern critical zone. It's in equilibrium with modern waters. It has been reset, relabeled by uh, poor waters in soils, by groundwaters, by the river water itself and the strontium isotope data provides really compelling evidence of that. Now, what we can do with that though, is we can say our river sediment has got a given cation exchange capacity. So a total capacity for cation exchange, and we can explore the, based on our measurements, and we can explore the effect on silicate weathering based on a given value of beta sodium. Now, what I don't know is the beta sodium value for rocks within a given catchment. I know the beta sodium value for rocks that are in equilibrium with seawater. So if I was to take a, a particular basin and I was to argue that, or, uh, and I only had marine sedimentary rocks in that basin and that nothing else had happened to those marine sedimentary rocks since they'd been uplifted or since they'd equilibrated with seawater, and deposited on the continents, then they would have had a beta sodium value of 0.6. Uh, but they will, of course, reacted, will have reacted over time. Uh, and uh, that those beta sodium values may well get reduced by processes of diagenesis, for example, during either on the seafloor itself, with carbonate precipitation, or, uh, or during the uplift and exhumation process or if you haven't got sufficiently rapid erosion, if you're in weathering limited catchments, you may find that the exchange pool gets relabeled quite quickly, but you end up with uh, a, yeah, a relabeled exchange pool. 
almost all of the catchments that we're looking at, and indeed the high CO2 consumption catchments are associated with very rapid erosion. Um, and so I think you've got rapid exhumation of uh, where you have sedimentary rocks of, of a marine exchange pool is what I think is, is going on. Our conservative value for what it's worth is calculated at a beta sodium value of 0.2, which is based on measurements from uh, marine sediments, which we think have been uh, relabeled, reset by interaction with carbonate. So, so that's what we took like if you, the value from. Okay, so it sounds like that if you want to test a beta sodium value of 0 0.6 on land, then uh, will, will it be helpful if you like collect some river sediment samples from like very small catchments well the disorogy is very like a single disorogy uh outcrop so, and also the exhumation is quite low i mean if you know that uh, can't look at the river sediment that's the problem so a river sediment will have already exchanged you need to get hold of some material which has not seen uh 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 a water which is different to seawater so the only way to do it is drill core so you have to drill and you have to drill quite deep and you have to get hold of rocks which are unweathered. And so if you do that, and there are various uh, deep laboratories around the world um, where this is the case, where people have drilled into shales. Uh, there's an excellent example in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, a deep laboratory uh, that is, I think, 300 meters deep and which is contained largely within shales, marine shales. And there, the beta sodium values are still 0.6. Uh, but you have to get hold of rocks which haven't interacted with calcium bicarbonate waters, which are the majority of waters which are present at the, uh, on the continents. You've got it, the, the exchange pool will immediately reset as soon as you're uh, in, in, in contact with, uh, with a water of different composition. Okay, yeah, got it. Thank okay, you. good. All right, well, we have one more question before I read the question on the chat. You also can open the chat to read. And I have another quick question. You know, uh, uh, Professor Slisky from the University of Colorado, uh, last a couple of years, uh, he did some research about global river temperature change. Yeah. So if we have that kind of value, could we develop some kind of model, you know, with the temperature change, even a half degree, of that temperature change will affect, I believe, you know, the CO2 gassing release. Yeah, sure, a absolutely. The, uh, uh, and that's something that people are working on to try and understand, and have worked on for a long time to try and understand the temperature sensitivity of, of weathering. And, and of course, in the simplest possible uh, sense, when it's warmer, weathering will, will go faster. Now, the interesting thing from the point of view of this is that could work in two different ways. The textbook view of that would be that would lead to more CO2 consumption, but the take home view that you might think about from this talk is, well, that could lead to more CO2 release and actually a positive feedback, yeah. which but, is then, you know, potentially quite a, a, quite a worrying prospect and why there's a need to understand uh, in particular the, the release of CO2 from sulfuric acid, uh, you know, as, as soon as we possibly can. But is there any paper, you know, talk about the global scale, about the global change, temperature? About the temperature change. Yeah, there, there are some, um, but it's not as widespread as you might think. And I think probably part of the problem, or, or that you might wish it to be, and part of the problem is, uh, is trying to remove noise from the, from, from the data. And I think if you look at some of the key controls on, on river chemistry, more often than not, you know, this, this is one of the, the classic questions is trying to separate out a temperature effect from a, an amount of water effect or a hydrology mm -hmm. uh, effect. And I, I look at most of our data and I think the, the first influence is the hydrological effect. Yeah, temperature effect is a, is, a, yeah. is a harder, you're trying to tease out a smaller signal um, and, and it's gonna be, that's, that's harder to tease out, I think. Okay, so okay, here's a question from uh, pa, pa, pa Kahan. Pre, pre Kahan. No? no, thank you for a wonderful talk. Anyway, here the question, he has uh, some, he asked a question. He said, I understand that we will get clean mineral as a product of silicate weathering, right? 
and it continues. When silicate weathering is reduced, will it also affect the amount of clay in the, these rivers? And will the change amount of the clay have further impact on cation exchange? Yeah, another good question. Yeah, ab absolutely right. Um, if you have less clay in the system, you have less uh, scope for cation exchange. And if silicate weathering is reduced, then you will be delivering less new clay to, to the system. And so from that point of view, it's absolutely right. What I'm mostly pondering in, uh, in, in, in this talk is the effect of old marine clays. And so, you know, those are intrinsically present in the source dependent on the, on the tectonic setting. So they're, they're clays which are already there, they've already been produced uh, and in a sense, the, the effect that we're talking about here is being diluted by the presence of, of modern clays or the, the, what I call the neo-formation of, of clays. Okay, wonderful. Is there any other question? If, any, if you have any question, you can just uh, unmute yourself, go ahead and ask. Okay. If, if not, I would like to mention again, this Friday, this coming Friday, we have other talk from Edward Anthony. You know, he's the chief editor of Marine Geology. He will talk about a case study of the Amazon, Mekong, Irrawaddy, and the Nalja Deltas. And also this presentation and all presentation is recorded on the YouTube channel. So I just put a YouTube uh, URL in the chat address. So if you feel like, I, I'm pretty sure many people want to rewatch and step-by-step step of this talk, you can always go back to the YouTube to rewatch it. And uh, so uh, if uh, no any other question, let's see, I think we can stop here. Thank you, Edward, very much. And uh, thank you to so many Chinese colleagues. I know it's the Middle Evil Festival people had to drink a wine, eat the moon cake and watch the moon. So uh, it's uh, thank you very much. And uh, so I see you this uh, coming Friday. Uh, okay, cool. Okay, thank you, bye-bye.